Hey guys, welcome to another episode in the deep playthrough uh, of AC Unity, the epilogue so to say. I'm just scanning through the database to get up on all the um, um, entries that I uh, did not reach yet or yeah, are a bit fake. Just to get a good grip, to close it off with a good grip on the story and all the characters and locations. Uh, it's a deep playthrough after all, this is just part of it. I didn't get a chance to read all of them during the playthrough itself. Here we go, continuing. Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, had he been born a few weeks earlier, Napoleon would have been... Italian. What a terrifying thought. He was born with the Italianized version of his name, Bueno Parte, on the island of Corsica, which belongs to Genoa, Genoa until the Genoese sold their rights to the French crown. The skinny Napoleon had a difficult adolescence, badly dressed and with a heavy Corsican accent. His rustic manners were out of place among the smart young nobles who attended the same military school as he did. The future emperor, the booted Jacobin, was a bad boy who was often absent. In six years he notched up 38 months of leave for 33 months of presence under the French flag. Holy, I would not have expected that. So in fact he was quite Italian then. In 1791 he spent several months in Corsica to help Pasqual Paoli, the Corsican liberator who would go on to hate and distrust the Buonaparte family. He exceeded his leave of absence and was struck off on January the 1st, 1792. Although a civilian once more, he was promptly appointed Colonel of a battalion of volunteers that would fire on demonstrators protesting against the civil constitution of the clergy. Without being ordered to do so, he took the citadel of Ajaccio. Alright, I'm just uh, sometimes looking stuff up that I really have no clue about. Where the hell is Ajaccio? I assume in Corsica or something. Uh, yes, I think it's uh Yes, it's in South Corsica All right, and then uh, what was again that civil Constitution of the clergy. A law passed on Ju July 12, 1790 during the French Revolution that caused the immediate subordination of the Catholic Church in France to the French government. Ah, okay, that's to um, decrease the power of the church, separation of church and state, which I think in general is a good thing. Um, you say self-motivated, I say roots. Well, later he took part in the revolutionary days of June 20th and August 10th, 1792. I know August 10th is the storming of the, Basti of the Palais de Tuileries and the, yeah, the cancellation of the monarchy. But what was June 20? One second. The demonstration of June 20, 1792 was the last peaceful attempt made by the people of Paris to persuade King Louis XVI of France to abandon his current policy and attempt to follow what they believed to be a more empathetic approach to governing. demonstration occurred during the French Revolution. Its objectives were to convince the government to enforce the Legislative Assembly's rulings. 
defend France against foreign invasion and preserve the spirit of the French constitution of 1791. The demonstrators hoped that the king would withdraw his veto and recall the Girondin ministers. All right, and the French constitution of 1791 was the first written constitution in France created after the collapse of the absolute monarchy of the Ancien Regime. On one of the basic precepts of the French Revolution was adopting constitutionality and establishing popular sovereignty. sovereignty. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizens of 1789. Who wrote that one again? All right, National Constituent Assembly as well. Um, eventually became the preamble of the constitution um, that we're now talking about. The French Constitution of 1791. The declaration offered sweeping generalizations about rights, liberty and sovereignty. A 12-member constitutional committee was convened in 1789, the day of the storming of the Bastille. Main contro controversies early on surrounded the issues of what level of power to be granted to the King of France, uh, i.e. veto, suspensive or absolute. And what form would the legislature take, unicameral or bicameral? Um, and he would, the king would get a suspensive veto, which could be overridden by three consecutive legislators. After very long negotiations, the constitution was reluctantly accepted by King Louis XVI in September 1791. interesting so yet the storming of the Bastille uh, and that was the, the yeah the start of writing that Constitution and what was the trigger for the storming of the Bastille an event that occurred uh, on the afternoon of July the 14th 1789 same day a 12 member constitutional committee was convened uh, revolutionary storm to seize control of the medieval armories fortress and political prison known as the Bastille the, at the time the Bastille represented royal authority in the center of Paris the prison contained only seven inmates at the time of its storming but was seen by the revolutionaries as a symbol of the monarchy's abuse of power. Its fall was the flashpoint of the French Revolution. Well, interesting. All right, sorry, that was a pretty big sidetracking going from uh, June the 20th. That was the last peaceful demonstration. Uh, and then we went to the French Constitution of 1791 and then the storming of the Bastille and the Declaration of Rights of Men and Citizens which is part of that Constitution of 1791 the Declaration of the Rights of um, Men and of the Citizen was two years, two years earlier out of 1789 all right a bit of French history over there um, all right so in 1792 yeah actually already in you had a demonstration on June 
20 of 1792 and the storming of the Bastille was yeah already in 1789 So, when was the Declaration of the Rights of Man? It's in August. Alright, so you had the storming of the Bastille still in July 89, and then the Declaration of Rights of Man in August 89, so only a month later. And then in 91, there was this new constitution. And then in 92, June was the last peaceful protest although I find that a little bit weird uh, the last peaceful attempt um, yeah, to uh, have Louis the 16th change course but if the storming of the Bastille already took place in 89 yeah, that was also against the monarchy that was not really a peaceful attempt so I would say there was already rioting going on way before us in 92 but anyways um, later he took part in the revolutionary days of June the 20th and August the 10th 1792 August the 10th I already checked uh, two episodes ago but I forgot it was some kind of a preparation for something I think the insurrection of August 10th was a defining event of the French Revolution when armed revolutionaries in Paris, increasingly in conflict with the French monarchy, stormed the Tuileries Palace. It led to the abolition, uh, abolition of the monarchy. Yes, so they stormed the royal palace, so to say. So June 20th, there was a, la a peaceful, uh, la last peaceful protest against the king and uh, August 10th, they actually stormed his palace. His participation in the siege of Toulon, though he did not take the city all by himself, and his mastery of artillery gained him the admiration of Augustin Robespierre. It's a bit weird. Here he is called Maximilien François Isidore. And here he is called Augustin. Ah, that's the younger brother of the revolutionary leader Maximilien Robespierre, who appointed him brigadier general and put him in command of the artillery of France's army of Italy. Following the failed royalist Putsch of 13 Vendemiaire, where under the orders of Paul Barra, whose mistress he would go on to marry, He gunned down the Voltigeurs. He returned to Italy, this time as general in chief. It was during the next four years that his life forever changed better than anyone he knew how to exploit his victories and cover up his defeats for the sake of public opinion. In France, everyone remembered the Battle of the Pyramids, which he won, while hardly anyone remembered the Battle of Aboukir Bay, which he lost. Widely recognized by the age of 30, he sought neither to be an aristocrat nor a revolutionary. When his mother reprimanded him one day, he famously replied, Io sono imperatore. I think that means something like I am emperor. In 1799, he affirmed Io sono Bonaparte. He had become second to none. He had also mostly lost his Corsican accents. <coughs> All right, let's quickly check that one out. One moment. Um, yo, so no. Imperatore. Imperatori. Oh, 
I am peace? No. I am emperor, not my mother. All right. He was pretty um, convinced of himself. Um, all right, that was Napoleon, and then of course he became, uh, yeah, he became um, emperor. Pierre Belek. This one I think is totally fictional. I'm not sure, but I think so. Born in, nah, maybe not. Born in New France sometime around 1740. What the hell is New France? God damn it! There are so many little tidbits. I don't know. New France. Was the area colonized by France in North America, beginning with the exploration of the Gulf of St. Lawrence by Jacques Cartier in 1534, and ending with the cession of New France to Great Britain and Spain. All right. The French actually colonized the Americas. Um, one second, just curious. Yeah, it's actually North America. So you had Spain, Great Britain and France. Man, France was um, one of the biggest colon colonizers. Uh, in the 18th century, 1750. All right. Um, anywho, Pierre Belec joined the French colonial militia at the age of 16, at the start of the Seven Years' War. He served with some distinction, earning a commendation for valor at the Battle of Fort Bull, but mustered out and traveled to France in 1762. As luck would have it, just barely missing a massive purge of the colonial branch of the Brotherhood by the Templars. Uh, don't worry, those don't happen anymore. Well, hardly ever. You know what? Look at yours, just to be sure. He seems to have settled in Paris, judging from the numerous arrest records in his name over the next two decades. He may have been at the Bastille in 1789, but no conclusive proof naming him as one of the prisoners has ever surfaced. He died under peculiar circumstances in April of 1791. Reportedly, his body found strangely garbed in the upper chapel of the Saint Chapelle Cathedral. Yes, that was one of the missions where Arno had to take him out. To this day, the surest way to start a fight in a room full of assassin historians is to shout, Belek was right, or the surest way to start a fight, or really, Belek was wrong. Either that or a kick to the shins. Many assassin historians have phenomenally weak shins. All right. <coughs> um, yeah, what is garbed? That is like clothing. I've no idea. Garbed meaning dress in distinctive clothes. Yes. All right. And Pierre Belek. Let's see if he really existed. I get a lot of hits, but that are real current day persons. No, I'm not um, sure. Let's see. I think he is fictional. Mm. 
Yeah, he apparently, in the story, he was a master assassin of the French Brotherhood. Let's just assume he was fictional. I'm not fully sure, but I'm pretty sure. Um, anywho, Roy, that tune. Yes, there are mostly these guys are old, like this one, this one, this one. They are all assassination targets. This one as well. That's also why below it says Assassin 6 Temper 0. Uh, this one we killed Danton maybe as well no I don't think so no this one we killed on top of the temple I think it was Germain we killed uh, this one maybe as well no he went to the guillotine this one was his uh, godfather this one was way before the events in this story, I think. <coughs> Maybe this was one of the guys that was conspiring to uh, take out the Jacques de Molay Grand Master. Um, Twelve ninety two was Jacques de Molay, Grandmaster, and this guy was. Yeah, there is no date here, but here it says upon the strength of this evidence, the Order of the Four Knights or the Knights Templar were rounded up and destroyed. Yes. All right. This one we killed. Uh, this one we killed. The first one. This is Arno, this is also a heroine, and this one I, yes, I, I, we killed as well. Although I really don't remember where we killed him. I think I already looked this up two episodes ago, but I again um, forgot, so allow me to quickly look that up. Um, A, C, Unity, La Touche. He was a pretty fun character. He really was like um, a rat, so to say. Scheming and betraying everyone. Ah, I remember again. Um, as long as he could save his own uh, interests, we killed him uh, while he was actually conducting a public execution at the guillotine. We got close and we stabbed him in the neck. But anyways, a lot of these entries are assassination targets. Alright, we are now at... We were off for... Here. Uh, this is also one we killed the guy that set up like this ambush for Arno, but M Arno just went around it and uh, next stabbed him. Roy de Tune, roughly King of Beggars, is a title claimed <coughs> by various influential figures among the indigent population of Paris. The first written references to someone using that name dates to the reign, reign of Louis XIV, but it's likely the term is much older. Some were benevolent spokespeople and organizers, others were ruthless extortionists and murderers. But it's fair to say... Um, that whoever they were, if they walked around, called themselves the King of Beggars, you could be pretty sure they were complete jack wagons. That was the footnotes. Really lame footnotes. Direct attestations are difficult to come by, but anecdotal evidence suggests that the man claiming the title in 1791 may have been the acknowledged illegitimate son of a minor nobleman who rose to a position of power in the Cour de Miracle district sometime in the late 1770s. 
His fate uh, remains unknown, but in an unpublished letter dated early February 1791, the Marquis de Sades remarked the king is dead and none of his miracles can now save him. Since Louis XVI would not be executed for almost two years, it's suspected that this may refer to the, to the Roy de Thun, Assassin's Tool, Templar Zero. Alright, so that is February 91. Just curious what we were... Just... Uh, reading about uh, all right june 20th and august 10th were big dates in the french revolution and this was half a year earlier uh, a bit more than half a year earlier No, more than a year earlier, sorry. Uh, before the, the June 20th uh, royal demonstration, or demonstration against the royals. All right, let's see if we have 30 minutes left. Let's see if we can make this uh, entry. Uh, Rose Bertin, born on July 2nd, 1747. Rose Bertin became known as Marie Antoinette's minister of fashion. Now there's a job I'd be good at. She opened her first boutique, Le Grand Mongolian, when age 22 in the very chic Saint Honoré neighborhood. I wouldn't say my French is perfect, but on first glance she seems to have named her shop the Big Mongolian. If I'd been her minister of fashion, I think I'd have advised her to change that. I don't care how big the Mongolian in question was, it could be massive. It's no excuse. Who's going to shop at the Big Mongolian? <laughs> All right, this one is pretty funny. She soon diversified her offering to include bonnets, mantelets, pelis, bows, bows, and shirt veils. What the hell is a bow? That's like a weapon. I, I think she, this is meant as a garment or some sort. Of some sorts. I'm not sure. Sure. What are shirt feels? What is shirring? Uh, one moment. Gather by means of drawn or elasticized threads in parallel rows. Uh, I think that's just like knitting, but then smaller. Uh, all right, it has like a. Yeah, a plea, or how do you say it? A. Pleated. Maybe that's. If you sure something, you make it pleated. Maybe. Um, it's like a, a little uh, decoration in uh, in a garment. Um, the queen was enthralled by such refinements and, with Rose Bertin's help, set about transforming the Ver Versailles dress codes. Dresses were simplified to allow women greater freedom of movement, in particular by abandoning panniers, which were considered too cumbersome. Alright, what the hell is a panier? Is that like that big... Um, broadening at the waist, or at the uh, buttocks, thighs? A basket, especially one of a pair carried by a, best, a beast of burden. Part of a skirt looped up around the hips. Yes, I think that's that little, uh, the big loop. 
I'm sorry to go on about this, but you just don't name shops after random, enormous Mongolians. Rose pretend success and popularity soon brought her an international clientele from cities as far afield as Koblenz, Brussels, London and St. Petersburg. It was thanks to this diverse base of customers that she managed to survive the revolution. She left France during the reign of terror and would only return in 1800. Finally, a smart person just leave that weird place, mass psychotic place. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm no hero. I probably would also have left or at least tried to leave. Uh, never underestimate the idiocy of the mob, so to say. Uh, the Crimson Rose, the Scarlet Pimpernel and the Crimson Rose are fictional figures that take the spirit of various genuine historical characters. Um, aristocrats who attempted to subvert the goals of revolutionary fronts. It's just as well they're fictional, because imagine you were real and you had a nickname like that. Oh, thank goodness, the Scarlet Pimpernel is here. It would be impossible not to think people were being sarcastic. Um, I don't understand what the first m m m sentence means. They are fictional figures that take the spirit of various genuine historical characters. What is taking the spirits by a fictional figure even mean? Probably if you would just say some historical characters were nicknamed the Scarlet Pimpernel or the Crimson Rose, I would get it. I think that is what they mean, but it's, it's formulated quite uh, confusing in my view. <coughs> So one of these is William Wickham, born in 1761 in Yorkshire, England. Wickham, a lieutenant colonel in the army of His Majesty King George III, organized a spy network based in Switzerland and France to coordinate with French royalists and combat the Great Terror. After Thermidor, that's some kind of a new monthly uh, naming convention uh, in, during the revolution, he returned to England and died peacefully in 1840. I think Thermidor is a month, but I'm actually not sure. Maybe I know they have like weird month names after the revolution, but yeah. Uh, that was the 11th month in the French Republican cal calendar. Um, yeah, it's a bit weird that they that so basically it's November. So why did they put a year there? They just say after November he returned to England and he died in 1840. Yeah, I have no idea when he returned to England now. Is that also in 1840 or was that earlier? All right, Thermidor was a revolt. It's not to be confused. Ah, apparently it was also a revolt. But the, uh, here it says it was a month. So let's Google Thermidor revolt. It probably was a revolt in November or Thermidor. And this will probably give us a year as well. The Thermidorian regime Uh, to mean the phase in some revolution when power slips from the hands of the original revolutionary leadership and the radical regime is replaced by a more conservative regime. Alright, so that is probably when the Jacobins were put to the gallows themselves. The Thermidorian reaction is the common term in the historiography of the French Revolution for the period between the ousting of Maximilien Robespierre on 9th Thermidor the 2nd or uh, 27 July 1794 that is weird here it says that it's in July Thermidor well um, the actual other wiki entry says it is the 11th month and the inauguration of the French directory on November the 2nd, 1795. All right, so it's a period. 
<coughs> so uh, yeah, in between 91 and 94, this dude, um, Wickham, returned to England. And the French Directory, which was established in... This is again confusing. The one article says the inauguration of the French Directory on November 2nd, 95. Oh no, by the way, it does make sense. Uh, that was... Um, governing five-member committee in the French First Republic when it was overthrown by Napoleon. But it's weird, here in this article it said like the ousting of Maximilien Robespierre on 9th Thermidor II, which would be July 27, 1794. And then I go back one wiki entry and I was looking for Thermidor and it says the 11th month in the French Re uh, Republican calendar. Ah, uh, okay. It's really confusing. Thermidor was the 11th month in the French Republican calendar. The month was named blah blah blah. Thermidor was the second month of the summer quarter. It started July, it ended August. All right, I don't have no idea. What? Why is the second month of the um, summer quarter is the eleventh month in the French Republican calendar? Probably their months were <coughs> much shorter, I guess. All right, I'm now checking it out. You have one, two. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. No, you have 12 months. Uh, but it actually begins in autumn. So it, it begins in September and it ends uh, in August. All right, really confusing. Um, so he uh, returned to England in Thermidor and died peacefully in 1840. Thermidor was a revolt, it's not to be confused with Lobster Thermidor, just in case you thought that after a lovely Thermidor, Wickham returned to England and died peacefully of seafood poisoning. Yeah, it's really lame, I must say, these, uh, mostly lame, these footnotes. All right, um, Thomas de Carmeillon. Born in 1276 in the Republic of Metz, Thomas de Carmillon was a wealthy banker and economic rival of the Knights Templar. He contributed a sizable force, probably of Flemish mercenaries, to Philip IV's arrest and imprisonment of the Templars on October the 13th, 1307. Um, with his chief rifle out of the way, Thomas and his cabal of supporters, including such luminaries as Dante Alighieri, Marco Polo and Domenico Auditori, spread their influence across Europe, toppling monarchs and bishops alike as they saw fit. He died of an illness in Venice sometime around the spring of 1323. All right, uh, I'm pretty quickly checking out whether that were real life persons. I know Marco Polo was, but yeah, the other guy I think as well, Dante Ali 
Gary. A Florentine poet, writer, and philosopher. All right. And with Florentine, I I think they would mean Florence. All right. Okay. Yes. All right. Then we have Marco Polo. That was the great explorer, I guess. Marco Polo. Trader and explorer. What did he find? I think he was Portuguese. No, he was Italian. Um, about the Mongols, China, Persia. India, Japan, and other Asian cities and countries. <coughs> All right, interesting. Curious guy. Curiosity is uh, a very important trait to have, I think. so annoying if I start reading Wikipedia I get really into the rabbit hole always all right um, anywho Now I'm really going into something totally unrelated, but allow me one quickly. At he, because it was about um, that Alighieri guy, uh, a painting, and then it said it was some kind of made by uh, a certain kind of um, fast drying paint at the time. And then I saw the word binder water soluble binder and I uh, clicked on that and then I became I saw adhesion and then cohesion then I checked those two definitions and it's not really clear what the difference is um, cohesion is the property of like molecules of the same substance to stick together to stick to each other due to mutual attraction. Adhesion is the property of different molecules or surfaces to cling to each other. Ah, okay. For example, solids have high cohesive properties, so they do not stick to the surfaces they come in contact with. All right, clear. Uh, we were talking about Dr. Alighieri and Mark Polo, and then Domenico Auditore. Yeah, that was one of the assassins, right? Or it's Ezio Auditori, of course. Um, a member of the Italian Brotherhood of the Assassins. Yeah, I think this is... <coughs> this is... Um, pretty funny that I like it really a lot that they mix fiction with uh, historical with history real life history because I think that Domenico Auditore the father of uh, I guess that is the father of Edgio right uh, he was the founder of the Auditore family Let's quickly read that. He 
was the great great grandfather of Ezio. Alright. Um Oh dear, real history time. Thomas de Carnillon was mentor of the French Brotherhood in the late 13th through early 14th centuries. He was one of the key participants in the downfall of the original Templar Order back when they conveniently wore enormous red targets on their chests. Those Flemish mercenaries were us, by the way, but I'm guessing you already saw that when you experienced Helix or whatever focus group tested audience approved marketing speak they're using these days. After Jacques de Molay and his cronies were rounded up Thomas and his assassin brothers and sisters spent a decade crisscrossing Europe. On a side note, I spent a month crisscrossing Europe after university and to tell you what, it bloody felt like a decade. At least those guys spent their time rooting out temper influence wherever they found it. I spent mine chasing a Spanish girl called Catalina who I thought had stolen my heart but in fact had stolen my wallet. Anyway, did you enjoy the renaissance? You can think, thank Thomas de Carnillon and his associates for paving the way for it. Alright, was that guy real or not? I don't think so. Anyway, again a lame footnote. Uh, a much too long and pretty lame footnote entry. No, I'm pretty sure he was not real. Uh, all right, two more to go. I'm already way over the 40 minute marker, but here we go. Um, not to be Thomas Alexander Dumas, not to be confused with his son, the famous French author. This Alexander Dumas, who also went by the name Thomas Alexander Dumas, was the son of a lesser French nobleman, Alexandre Antoine Davy, Davy, Marquis de la Pelleterie, and the Black Slave. Um, Marie Cézette Dumas in Saint-Domingue. The Marquis returned to Paris with his son in 1776. Briefly selling young Thomas Alexander into slavery, possibly in order to get him into France legally. This is why you read these comments. I add the appalling historical details because I care. Yeah, you also... Uh, are quite lame often with those footnote comments. Dumas stood well over six feet tall and knew no fear. He joined the first battalions of the revolution in the rank of private using his mother's name to avoid family shame at being of such a low rank. But his, his father was uh, a lesser French nobleman and a black slave. Yeah, I mean, slave is lower than a lesser French nobleman, I would say. But probably that is uh, because if you're a slave, yeah, nobody knew about that name at all, probably. Uh, using his mother's name to avoid family shame and being of such a low rank. Ah, no, it's the other way around, I guess. Because he joined in such a low rank of privates, he didn't want anyone to know that uh, yeah, one of the uh, his family uh, is acting in such a low rank, I guess. Men of noble lineage could enter directly into commissioned ranks, but it was difficult for someone of a mixed race to do so. <coughs> it's fun to try to guess why. Dumas went on to have a dazzling military career, attaining the rank of general. He served as second in command to the Chevalier Saint George in the Black League, Legion. So named, it was comprised of three men of color. He later led the Army of the Alps as commander in chief. Uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, later in his career, Duba found himself at odds with Napoleon Bonaparte when he was captured and imprisoned in 1799. The Bonaparte did nothing to secure his release, and Duba returned to France ill and impoverished. He was denied pension from the army and died in 1806 at the age 44. That is really crazy that he didn't get a pension while he was a general and did quite some good. Uh, and also what I noticed, a lot of these guys who were previous allies, they all fall out with each other. Also uh, within the, the revolutionary factions. They, they all, uh, there are so many complications and uh, intrigues that it's quite tiring to be honest. Uh, Alright, last one, Elise Lasser. We already read it, but I will just read it because he's such an important character, so I will read it again. I will read it again. The only daughter of Francois and Julie de la Serre, Elise grew up in a modestly wealthy but incredibly privileged environment. As a member of the aristocracy in the waning days of the Ancien Regime, she had access to the finest tutors, medicine and food available. After her mother's death in 1778, Elise spent a great deal of time traveling, including several years of study in Paris. Alright. It doesn't say where she grew up actually, only that Paris is part of her travels. Seems like she was getting a healthy dose of temper training and indoctrination during this time. Must be nice to get your training along the French Riviera. I had to make do with a leaky shed in Wolverhampton. After her father's death, she seems to vanish from documented history, likely as a result of revolutionary efforts to purge records of the nobility or the Templars trying to cover up one of their regime changes. Alright, that were all the general persons. Then we have a couple of groups and yeah, quite a lot of Paris stories, but I think they are mostly briefer uh, bios, I hope, because it are a lot, uh, than the general one. But anyways, we have to get through it. In the next episode, we'll continue. I hope you enjoyed. I hope to see you there. For the meantime, do not forget, always do. Keep on gaming. See you later.